Heavenly Father, I just thank You for this Word. I know, Lord God, that the flower fades, the grass withers, but the Word of the Lord shall stand forever. And I pray, Heavenly Father, this Word would resonate deep in our hearts. It would bring about transformation um, in our world and liberty and hope and optimism and peace. In Jesus' mighty Name, Amen, Amen. So if you have your Bibles out there, um, can you just open with me uh, to Luke? Uh, chapter 5 and verse 1. This message is actually entitled, uh, Launch Out Into the Deep. Uh, Launch Out Into the Deep. Uh, Luke 5 verse 1 says this, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon Him, speaking of Jesus, to hear the Word of God, that came from his mouth, he stood at the lake and he saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of the boats and they were washing their nets. They were done working for the day. They'd quit. There was no fish about. Um, There's a term at the moment called quiet quitting. Has anyone ever heard of it uh, before? It's a viral term. And this is where people today just do what is required at work. Minimum effort to keep their jobs, but they're not interested in going the extra mile. So these fishermen were washing their nets. They were done for the day. Then in verse 3, it says this, And he entered into one of the boats, Jesus, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down in the boat and he taught the people from the boat. Jesus turned this boat into a podium. Don't you love Jesus? No microphone, no platform, no marketing campaigns, no flyers. He just preached from the boat and people came and pressed upon Him so much that He was almost in the lake. Then in verse 4, it says this, Now, when He was through speaking, I love this. It doesn't even tell us what He said during His message, because that wasn't what was important. The lesson is here. And when when Jesus was through speaking, He said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets, everyone say nets. nets. Let your nets down for a catch. Now this is really interesting because Simon had done, was done fishing. He was a fisherman. Jesus was a carpenter. What does he know about fishing? But anyway, Jesus said, and here's the deal, ready? Fish don't bite during the day. It's too hot. So they go down deep, right? Um, but Jesus, when Jesus is with you, it actually doesn't matter what time it is. Um, it doesn't matter whether you thought it was over. It doesn't matter whether you thought you missed your season or you missed the opportunity. Jesus is now in your boat. Now, you know what I've learned from this text is that even though Simon owned the boat, Jesus owned the sea. (laughs) And what you need right now maybe isn't in your boat. Maybe it's actually in the sea. (laughs) And then verse 5 says this, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all day, sorry, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. Interesting. Jesus told him to let down the nets, but he let down the net, N-E-T. When Jesus says nets, make sure you carry the nets. They dropped their net when Jesus said, drop your nets. And because their thinking was too small. It was far too limited. When Jesus is in your boat, you better bring everything you've got. He wants to take you into overflow. But the problem is we underestimate what God can do for us. What you bought is not enough where God is taking you. And even though He was reluctant, He still did it. And verse 6 is this, And when they had done this, they enclosed the great multitude of fishes that their net began to break. Here's what's interesting. 
they had lost some of the blessing because they didn't do exactly what Jesus said. Amen. He said, bring nets. They let down a net and they lost a little bit of the blessing. Because And the blessing, interesting, it wasn't in the shallows. It was actually in the deep. One more verse and then we'll get into this this morning. Is this okay? Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 18 says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people. Amen. The New Living Translation says this, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light oh, so that you can understand the confident hope He has given to those He has called His holy people who are rich in His glorious inheritance. Listen, the way we choose to see the world creates the world we live in. Following Jesus makes me see the world differently. For example, the Bible says, all things work together for good. It doesn't say all things are good. It says that all things work together for good. Basically, that's saying that everything is rigged in my favour. Good or bad. Pandemic, no pandemic. Injury, no injury. Loss, rejection, it doesn't matter. It's all rigged in my favour. Can you imagine if you lived with that level of faith and level of optimism? You know what you'd actually become? If you actually believed that everything was rigged in your favour? You'd actually become unstoppable. (laughs) We need to understand that if we can get the, if we can put on the mind of Christ, if we can see things, not just bring a net, but bring nets for our catch and expect that sort of blessing in our world, imagine what God could do. Hey, there was an astronaut, Chris Hadfield, who spent five months on the International Space Station. And he said this, I love this, ready? He said, there is no problem so bad that you can't make it worse. <laughs> And do you know how you make your problems worse? By this stinking thinking. (laughs) By this limited mindset. God wants to do something great, but we're just bringing a net. I didn't want to call this message launch out into the deep. I'm sorry. I really didn't want to call it that. You know what I really wanted to call it? I really really wanted to call it, uh, what's your BS? But I didn't think that would go down all that well in a church community. (laughs) And what I mean by BS, sorry, and what I mean by BS is, is what's your belief system? <laughs> what were you guys thinking? <laughs> See, we all have this system of beliefs, right? This way of thinking that right now is harming you and for many of you holding you back. In, in fact, what I'm actually talking about is a concept called paradigms. Uh, Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, brought this to the forefront. This term was actually coined by a young man by the name of Thomas Kahn, who in 1962 wrote a thesis called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And in that thesis, he said this. He said, a paradigm is a global mindset through which society views the world. A paradigm shift. Everyone say paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is what I'm hoping every single one of you will have by the time I'm done here this morning. A paradigm shift occurs when society sees the world through a new mindset. Now, another way to phrase this is um, a, a synonym to the word paradigm is this, ready? A perception, a belief, a frame of reference, an assumption or a maximum. Do you want I think of three of the most devastating words in the English language? Are these, Ready? I just assumed. I just assumed I can never build that business. I, I just assumed I can never get an A in this subject. I just assumed I could never go to that university. I just assumed I could never write a book. We all have these assumptions, don't we? About ourselves, about other people and about the world in general. Sadly though, many of those assumptions that we have are actually inaccurate and complete. As a result, they're actually causing limitations. In fact, can I put it like this? 
Some people, when they hit 70, 75 years of age, you know what they're thinking? They're thinking, well, you know what? It's, it's time to retire. It's time to you know, start to um, rest, re recover, enjoy the last you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years of my life. But you know what some people are thinking? Some people at 70, 70 and 75 are thinking, hey, you know what? Like people like Donald Trump, jo Joe Biden, are thinking maybe it's time to run for president. <laughs> but we have this mindset and we don't, we don't even realise that we're taking it on because this is all what we've seen. In, in, in fact, um, let me put it another way. If you wear glasses like I do, and that if those glasses are the wrong prescription lens, you'll look at the world a little bit hazy, a little bit distorted. Many of us have the wrong lenses on or the wrong beliefs. And when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we're not getting an accurate representation of who we are. We're getting an image that's being distorted by the way that we think. God wants to expand us. He's asking us to bring nets, but we're bringing a net. This is why I pray that your eyes become enlightened to the fact of what God has prepared for you. In fact, let me put it like this. Um, if you choose to see all that is wrong with you and ourselves and others, then you will see it. If you believe that you're stupid, then that's what you'll get. If you lack confidence in any area, then you'll put it in a half-hearted response. The way you see the world greatly impacts your outcomes. I'll illustrate it like this. In the 1960s, they actually believed that it was completely impossible to run a mile, which is a little over 1,600 metres, in under four minutes. Running a mile in under four minutes actually meant that you had to push your body past the state of consciousness. And so doctors and scientists got together. They actually studied the human body. They actually worked out the human body actually was not physically capable of running that fast. They believed we didn't have the bone structure. We didn't have the anatomy. Because we weren't built like animals and couldn't run on all fours. We simply didn't have the power within ourselves to get up to those kind of speeds for that duration. And so the whole athletic world believed it was like a physical impossibility. In fact, you when they first started time in the mile, the first recorded mile back in the 1800s was four minutes and 28 seconds. Then the next year, someone improved, it got down to 426. Then she got down to 421, 413, 411, 402. And guess what? When it got down to four minutes and one second, something magical happened. People stopped improving. Why? Because the belief of the day, the paradigm of the day, the assumption of the day was impossible on under four minutes. We get right to that boundary, but we're under it. And that record lasted for an incredible eight years. But then along comes a guy by the name of Roger Bannister. And he says this, he says, you know what? I don't think it's a physical barrier that's stopping us. I think it's more of a mental or psychological barrier. So what happens is this. He starts to race out with two rabbits, two pace setters. These guys' job is to set the pace. He'll start the race with one guy to set the pace for him. Then that guy will run out. Then a fresh pace setter will run in. And all Roger Bannister has to do is keep up with both of these pace setters and he'll come home in under four minutes. So May the 6th, 1954, Roger Bannister is out there pushing his body to literally to break in point and actually comes home in an incredible time of three minutes, 59.4 seconds. Breaks the four minute mile barrier, breaks an eight year old record and does what everybody at that time thought was Humanly impossible. But you know what? This actually isn't the best part of this story. You see, because two months later, an Australian guy, true story, by the name of John Landy, who was the current world record holder, holder at four minutes and one second, as soon as he saw a lesser athlete do it, he thought, well, I can do this. So he runs the mile in three minutes, 58 seconds flat, bre breaks it, does a three-second PB, which is unheard of at this kind of world-class level. Six months later, 37 other athletes all run the mile in under four minutes. In 12 months, 300 people do it. Now what changed? Did suddenly human beings grow an extra lung? Did training methods improve? Did our body shape change? No, the thing that changes people's mindsets or perceptions and the whole world had what is known as a paradigm where they suddenly saw things in a completely different light. But you know what? That's still not the best part of this story. The best part of this story for me is this, ready? A reporter comes up to Roger Bannister and asks him this question. Roger, how'd you do it? 
How do you make the impossible possible, the unrealistic realistic? You know what Roger Bannister said? He said quite simply this, ready? He said, it's the ability to take more out of yourself than what you think you've got. And I've got some really, really good news for you, ready? There's actually more in you than what you think you've got. More courage, more determination, more faith, more optimism, more strength, more creativity, more fight. There's more in you than what you think. And what I want to help you see, maybe for the first time in your entire life, is this enormous well of potential that's on the inside of you waiting to be discovered. Because do you realise you're actually born with potential? You're not supposed to die with it. That potential is supposed to be harnessed and then released. In fact, let me illustrate it like this. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within. That means all its power, all its resources are within, all its authority is there. He also said the kingdom of God is at hand. What does that mean? That means it's within your reach. Everything that you need to get you to where you want to go is actually within your reach. Um, Moses, the staff is in your hand. Samson, the jawbone and the ass to kill these people is right there. It's, it's, it's within us. It's right. It is within us. It is in our hand. In fact, Jesus said, um, or Paul said, it's Christ in you that's the hope of glory. <laughs> so it's within you. We don't live in the world. We actually live in our heads. In fact, Proverbs 23 says, says this, as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. As you think, as you think in your heart, so are you. If you think you lack something, then you do. If, but if you, if you choose to live the, in this world with an abundance mindset, with, with an attitude that God is able, Amen. can you imagine what you could actually do? In fact, in, in Numbers 13, verse 33, it's talking about the 12 spies. And it says that they went out to, into the promised land. And there they saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, and they said this, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were we in their sight. Now, you know what's interesting about this? Is the Jewish tradition often asks the questions about this verse, and they say this, how could the cowardly spies have possibly known how they appeared in the eyes of the local inhabitants? Nobody really knows how other people perceive you. The answer, of course, if you feel like a grasshopper, then you'll most certainly appear to be one to those around you. Some of you don't see yourself how God sees you. And if you could get a glimpse of what God is thinking of you, that would blow your whole entire mind. In fact, let me illustrate it like this. Ready? We see the world as we are, but not as it really is. We see the world as we are, but not as it really is. Ah, let me explain it like this. I'm going to say something to you that can't be honest with you. I get into a little bit of trouble in some places for talking like this. Some people do not like me discussing this next idea because it's a little bit dangerous. <laughs> Truth is, actually, it's a little bit dangerous. So we'll just, get, we'll just see if I get invited back or not, right? <laughs> Listen, I actually believe uh, there is actually no such thing as uh, reality. There is only, wait for it, there is only perceived. No such thing as reality, only perceived. Now, of course, I believe in absolute truth. What I'm talking about? I'm talking about the lie that you tell yourself but actually call true. Amen. Let me illustrate it like this. Ready? Uh, back in the day, a hundred years ago, the reality of that day was this. Ready? What goes up? The reality of that day was birds fly, man does not. To believe that you could fly if you lived 100 years ago, my goodness, that was the most unrealistic, impossible, illogical thing you thought of. If you went around 100 years ago saying that I believe one day people would fly, that was almost enough for them to lock you up in a lunatic asylum. But two young boys by the name of Wilbur and Orville Wright, who were incidentally <laughs> bicycle mechanics. Note, they were not aerodynamic engineers. These boys were bicycle mechanics. And one day in their bike shop, Wilbur turned to his brother Orville and he said this. He said, you know what? I reckon one in the future we won't be building bicycles. 
I reckon one in the future we'll be building <laughs> flying machines that will carry people from one location to the next. And his brother said, do you think anything like this could happen? And these two boys began to take an unrealistic thought and began to discuss it until one day Orville can't sleep at night. He can't get this flying machine out of his head. So he wakes up in the middle of the night and draws a picture of what he thinks it'll look like. Takes it to the bike shop the next day and shows his brother. You know his brother says? Well, he goes, don't be stupid. It won't look like that. Look more like this. <laughs> they began to play with the design. Until one day in their bike shop, Wilbur turns to his brother Orville and he says this. He says, hey, listen, you don't think we've been designing out the back? Yeah. I actually think we've got the materials in this bike shop to actually build that thing. And out of spare bicycle parts, these two boys build the world's first flying machine. And guess what? In Kitty Hawk in America, in 1903 in North Carolina, their flying machine flew for 12 seconds. They made some adjustments and the second flight was 54 seconds. They made some more adjustments on the third flight, two minutes and 14 seconds. But that one 12 second flight changed the world. Why? Because if I want to go from Brisbane to Adelaide, like I'm doing this week, if I'm going from Brisbane to Adelaide in the year 2023, the most realistic thing for me to do today would be to? Why? The most rational thing for me to do would be to? Hey, your most logical and practical thing for me to do would be to fly. Yet 100 years ago, that was the most unrealistic, impossible, illogical thing you thought of. Let me ask you this question, ready? It's a personal one. Listen carefully to this, ready? What in your life right now seems completely impossible? What dream seems completely unrealistic? What goal seems completely improbable could actually make so you to challenge the way that you think? Maybe the only thing holding you back is because you think you can't, when in actual fact, you're far more capable than what you realise. I know you've toiled all night, I know you're tired. I know you're reluctant to get back in the boat and push out and launch into the deep. But that's exactly what Jesus is asking you to do. Sometimes we became, become overwhelmed by our own emotions that we fail to see that Jesus is asking us to launch out into the deep and take as many nets as what we can. But we're tired. We're over it. Interest rates are too high. Inflation is going up everywhere. And so what we do is we try and restrict ourselves rather than continue to expand. <coughs> Listen, the first responsibility of leadership is to define reality. The first responsibility of leadership, and I'm speaking to leaders, I assume, in this room, the first responsibility is to define reality. Hey, it was not realistic for JFK in the 1960s to say, we're going to land man on the moon. That was not a realistic goal because it hadn't been done before. You know what they knew how to do when he gave that vision? All he, they knew how to do was crash spacecraft into the ocean. They didn't even know whether they could even land on the moon or not, let alone take off from it or not. Hey, it was not realistic, think about this, for a black man in America to grow up to believe that he could become president when only 50 years ago blacks were still being hung on trees. Can you think about that for a moment? It was not realistic for Nelson Mandela to think that after spending 27 years in prison, he would one day become the president of the nation that sent him to prison. There's more in you than what you think you've got. You're far more capable than what you can even imagine or even uh, realise. In, in fact, do you know that your potential is actually unknown? It's unknowable. No one knows what you're potentially capable of actually achieving. In fact, can you do me this favour for a second? I want to prove something to you, ready? Can I ask everyone in the room right now, just raise their hand. I want to just raise their hand. Fantastic, good job. Okay, now do this, ready? Follow these instructions carefully. Now, raise it as high as you can. Okay, hold it there, hold it there, hold it there. Okay, now do this, ready? Now, raise it higher. Okay, <laughs> put your hand down. <laughs> do you see what just happened then? I even said to you, follow these instructions carefully. Not a single one of you could have got it right. Like seriously, I just said to you, raise your hand as high as you can. Then I said, okay, <laughs> now raise it higher. And then all of you magically, without any extra effort or training, <laughs> were somehow able to go higher. But still that wasn't as high as you could have gone. But on a single one of you just then, want to stand out. Every single one of you just then just chose comfort over courage. And we do it all the time, right? And it's become a pattern. It's literally become a pattern in our world where we now choose comfort over courage. 
And rather than take in the nets, we just reluctantly take a net and we lose half the blessing. In fact, um, so I'm just trying to find a way out. Let me give you this, ready? I'm gonna tell you the five ways that beliefs get formed. How you see yourself, why you see yourself like you ought to. There are five ways that these beliefs get formed. Ready, scribble this down. Number one is this. Beliefs get formed in your environment. Number one, your environment. Now listen, would you agree, and this saddens me, I can't believe how many young people today, when you think about this, grow up in home environments, still today in the year 2023, grow up in home environments that is either sexually, uh, physically, or emotionally abusive. If you grow up in a home environment where you're constantly verbally humiliated and constantly put down all the time, do you think that would have a pretty big bearing as to how you see yourself and what you see yourself accomplishing, yes or no? Yes. I'm amazed how much this happens, right? Particularly in some of our Indigenous communities. You go up and they just come and invite. It's tough, right? Second way the beliefs get formed is, is number two, is through events. Events small or large, right? Events impact the way that you think and, and feel. Uh, for instance, that's why it's really necessary for us to take every thought captive. Here's the problem, ready? If you, sorry, if you don't take a hold of your thoughts, then your thoughts will take a hold of you. If you don't take a hold of your thoughts, then your thoughts will take a hold. And some of you have let your thoughts take a hold of you and drag you to dark places. You've got to take a hold of them before they take a hold of you. And not allow the events that you've experienced in your life, at home, in family, in business, in various areas, to impact how you think about yourself. Does that make sense? Third area the beliefs get formed in is knowledge. Now, knowledge should actually empower you. You know the old saying, knowledge is power? But today, some of the knowledge gets dished out these days actually disempowers us. Some of the stuff that we hear in the media and on the news, everything's got an agenda and an angle, right? So you can't, and, and here's the biggest problem today, ready? We all live in silos. Do you know social media, you know what it allows you to do? It allows you to only be friends with people who uh, think the same way you think, and believe the same things you believe. And cookies and bots will send you preferences based upon your likes. So you don't actually have to associate with anybody who thinks differently to you. Does that make sense? So we have a a generation of people who've grown up thinking that the whole world believes what they believe because everyone they're connected to on social media believes what they believe. Does that make sense? You know, what, you know what I do regularly is I read books that I absolutely um, know that I'm going di- to disagree with. You know why I do that? Because either it will make my own thinking more robust or will change my mind. If we're going to expand our thoughts and not get caught up in these silos that we live in, we need to actually be interacting with people who maybe don't even really believe the stuff that we believe. Does that make sense? Number four is this, past results past results. Now listen, I don't know why people do this. Ready? Can anyone explain to me why this actually occurs? Think about this. Ready? Uh, Why do you think so many people today keep judging their future (laughs) based on their past? Don't you realise you could learn something today could actually alter your future forever? Why are you stuck in your past? Listen, I'm sorry if this sounds tough, but some of you actually really need to hear this. Ready? Listen to me. At some point, your past has to become your past. You cannot allow it to keep seeping into your present and keep keep polluting your future. Some of you keep tripping over things that are behind you. It's over now, you have to let it go. Why? Because if you don't let your past die, it's not going to let you live. And some of you keep carrying around this thing. It happened years ago, but it's like a dead corpse that's chained to your leg. And you keep dragging it everywhere that you go. And you wonder why your presence stinks because you can't let go of this thing. Did I describe that sufficiently enough? In, in fact, listen, let me be real, ready? The person that hurt you, listen, the person that hurt you, let's just be real. The person that hurt you probably does not deserve forgiveness. 
But you know what? You still need to forgive them. You know why? Because you deserve peace. The person that betrayed you, and we've all got someone in our life that did something to us, but we have to let it go. You know, you have to let go of your past and if, we're, if you're going to live in your future. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the, um, in, in fact, the Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You. Hang on a second. If the truth will set you free, that means a lo- there's a lie that's keeping you bound. And you know what the lie is? The lie is that you're not good enough. The lie is you don't have what it takes. The, lie, that's, the devil has, has lied to you long enough telling you that you can't do this. There's no way you can find a way around. Listen, we live in the knowledge age. You can hop online and learn anything you want about anything. <laughs> if you're struggling with anything, if you don't know how to turn a screwdriver, there are 5,000 videos online that will help you <laughs> learn to turn a screwdriver. <laughs> And the fifth area that beliefs get formed in is this, ready? In your imagination. That's faith that calls those things that be not as though they are. (laughs) What are you believing God for right now? Because that's what faith is, right? Faith calls those things that be not as though they they are. Um, Listen, you know, when I was doing track athletics at high school, I used to get really, really nervous before big carnivals. Can I relate to being nervous about anything? I used to make myself so nervous, I used to literally make myself vomit. When I'm on the way to the Nationals with my coach, he's sitting next to me and he says, this is Glenn, how are you feeling? I said, coach, I'm really nervous. He said, right, Glenn, we're going we're gonna to fix this. I said, how? So I'm going to begin to picture, imagine, visualise the perfect 100 metres and only describe it to me using positive affirmative terms. I said, coach, I can do that. So I, I said to him, I said, okay, coach, I see myself at the start of the 100 metres, feeling confident, feeling ready, feeling focused. I feel the warm sun on my back, the smell of the tartan comfort the track, the sights and sounds, but I'm focused on my lane. The call for the start list. I climb back in my blocks and feel like a coiled tiger ready to pounce. Bang, the gun goes off. I drive, 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 start down low, 40 metre mark, I'm now full stride, I'm accelerating all the way through the finish. As I began to imagine that over and over in my mind, guess what started to form? A belief about what the 100 metres were going to look like. So when I turned up there for real, it was like deja vu. <laughs> I've been here before. Where had I been there before? In my mind. Do you know that your mind cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is vividly imagined? And if you imagine something, it will actually become like it's real. Faith calls those things that be not <laughs> as though it is. So you can literally, and that's what, as human beings, that's what we actually are. We're constantly visualising futures. The problem is, and we do it all the time, the problem is most of the futures that you create aren't all that inspiring. <laughs> You're, the, the, you, we're constantly thinking about our future. You might be thinking, okay, I'm going to go down to the kitchen now and I'm going to make myself a Vegemite sandwich. <laughs> and that's awesome. But you could be visualising something grander than that about your future. But exact, maybe a steak or maybe, maybe, maybe about bringing hope to your community. What are you visualising for your future? Right? Maybe you're hungry, I don't know. And you know, you know the most courageous thing you can do is actually to redefine yourself. So don't allow yourself to, to be defined by your past or by your failures or by your rejections or by your missed opportunities, but to actually redefine yourself. Imagine if you actually redefined yourself how God sees you. You, you know, God all through the Bible is redefining people. He, he, went, he t- said, Abram, you're not going to be Abram and you're going to be Abraham. Not Sarai, but, but Sarah. Not Jacob, but Israel. Not ben- um, Benoni, but Benjamin. Not Simon, but Peter. Not Saul, but Paul. Constantly redefining people and helping them understand who they actually really are. Amen. Underneath all that doubt, underneath all that fear, underneath all that pessimism and negativity, you, have, you are a child of God. Amen. Why are you acting so small? You know the thing I love about Joseph? is that his father made him a technicolour coat. But the thing I love about Joseph is he actually wore it. (laughs) 
I mean, this is out in the desert. Most people are in beige. <laughs> and, and he's got this Technicolor coat. <laughs> but the dude wore it. He was like, I'm going to act like royalty. Even though I'm, I'm not yet, I'm going to act like I'm in the palace. Do you have the courage to look out from where you are at right now? Do you have the courage to actually launch out into the deep? Abraham, can you think outside the parameters of your current existence? Can you look out from where you are? Can you get out of the tent, Abraham? And can you go and look at the stars? Can you look at the sand on the seashore? What can you actually see? There's a reason why God got Abraham out of that tent. He needed him to see a vision for himself. Abraham wanted a son and God wanted to give him a nation. We keep bringing a net instead of nets. We keep limiting God. Hey, listen, do you know what? When I was in Mumbai a few years ago, um, Mumbai is like Billboard City, right? There's billboards everywhere of cricket players, Bollywood stars. If you walk into a news agency in Mumbai, you'll see on the front, ver- front cover of Vogue magazine an uh, image of uh, uh, an Indian. On the front cover of like um, Men's Health is an Indian with abs. <laughs> I grew up in Australia, right, back in the 80s, where you wouldn't see billboards of brown people. You wouldn't see magazine covers of brown people. So I grew up in Australia thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe... It's amazing how these thoughts, these ideas, maybe I can't be anything great. great. I go to Mumbai and I see all these brown people on billboards. I think I could have been a Bollywood star. (laughs) I I, I felt like my, my my childhood hurts all got healed. Because we didn't see any of that right now. Sure, there's lots of diversity right now, but it wasn't back like that back in the 80s. Does that make sense? And our mindset is limiting us. Listen, let me just wind this up for you. Ready? Um, back in the day when the circus came um, to town, um, or sorry, when circuses um, ha- had these big elephants, and when e- elephants would give birth to these little baby elephants, um, and they first come out of their mother's womb, baby elephants were quite weak and quite frail, and they're always trying to run away. So what the circus trainers do? They try to rope around the baby elephant's leg, the other end to a stake in the ground. This baby elephant tried to escape, but it couldn't. Because it wasn't trained properly, they had to kind of pin it down for a little while. But after a little while, this baby elephant learns that this circle they can move around in, it's actually its whole world. But guess what? After a little while, this baby elephant starts to grow and it actually gets to a point where it actually weighs a colossal five or six tonnes. It now has the strength right within itself to pull that rope and chain from the ground and run away. But you know what it doesn't? And you know why? Because now it's not being held back by a little rope and chain. No, 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 now it's actually being held back by something much more powerful. Now it's being held back by a memory of its past. And I can't tell you how many people I'm working with right now who are being held back by memories of their past. Past mistakes, past failures. You know that time you started to go off to your dream and didn't quite work out? You know, sometimes they'll give you your best shot and someone laughed at you or criticised you or judged you. And now you're being haunted by all those memories of your past. Listen, let me tell you something as clear as I possibly can. Ready? Look up here. Seriously, every day. Ready? Every day the sun comes up over the horizon. Guess what? It's a brand new day. And do you know what? You're tougher than what you were yesterday. You're stronger than what you... Hey, you've got more experience than what... So don't you ever allow your past to impact your future, or in other words, don't allow your history to get in the way of your destiny. (laughs) Because there's actually more in you than what you think you've got. More courage, more determination, more faith. I know you've toiled all night. I know it's been hard. I know you've been anxious, but tomorrow's a brand new day. (laughs) And if Jesus is in your boat, He's about to pour out a blessing of overflow in your life that will blow your mind. But we've got to reckon, we got to, first of all, we've got to have Jesus in our boat. The problem is there are some people who don't even want Jesus in their boat. Like seriously. No, no, God, I've got this all sorted myself. Well, if you had it all sorted yourself, why aren't you living the blessed life? 
God wants to, God wants to take you. Listen, if God bothers you, it's because He wants to better you. Amen. If God is going to get in your boat, it's because He's going to do something beyond your wildest dreams. I was sick. I was depressed. I was in this place where um, I didn't know if anything was going to work out. But I invited Jesus into my boat and He's given me a life that is far beyond my wildest dreams, far beyond anything I could have imagined in my whole entire life. Growing up here um, in Redcliffe, and I had the opportunity to travel all across this nation, nations of the world, because of what God has done in my world, what Jesus has done in my heart. Because I inclined my ear to Him as a young man and I never looked back. And I'm telling you, He can do the same, if not more, for you. Because let me be honest, ready? Your situation is not the problem. Your bank balance is not the problem. The kid at school who's annoying you is not the problem. Your thoughts are your problem. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I think, listen, I think I am an overcomer. You know why? Because that's what the Bible says about me. See, um, you are no better than the thoughts that you think. If you think you're little, you'll be little. If you think you're weak, you'll be weak. But if you think up, then you'll go up. If you think wrong, then you go wrong. If you think down, then you go down. Your thoughts are dragging you either up or down. So take a hold of your thoughts before they take a hold of you. You are literally one thought away from a miracle. One thought away from a miracle. Now listen, I'll close with this, ready? Um, Napoleon Hill um, said this, he was a Christian man. He said this, he said, if you can conceive it and believe it, then you can achieve it. Sounds a little bit trite, <laughs> um, but it's true, right? If you can conceive it. it. Now, I'm interested in the first three words, ready? If you can. You know, that tells me that tells me that some people can't. But if you can conceive, you know the dictionary definition of conceive is? Is this, ready? To cause, to bring to life. Can you bring to life your career of a prosperous future, of a healthy, can you bring your dream to life? Hey, don't take this literally, but can you almost become pregnant with it? (laughs) Okay, not a lot of people got that. (laughs) But listen, there has to be something on the inside of you kick in, trying to get out. Does that make sense? Listen, when my son was born, or sorry, before my son was born, um, we had to go, when my wife was heavily pregnant, she was like 19 weeks pregnant with Justice, we had to go get a scan of the baby, you know, just to make sure everything is okay. So you know what we did, let me describe that to you, ready? There's this dark room, a uh, screen up on a wall, a bed and a big machine. They put my wife on this bed, heavily pregnant with my son, 19 weeks, ready? They put this jelly on her belly, then they put this machine on the stomach. When they put the machine on the stomach, you'll never believe this, but an image of my son came up on the screen. I saw my son before he was born. I saw him move his arm. I saw him lift his foot. I actually heard his heart beat. You know what I should be able to do? I should be able to put a spiritual scan across your heart, across your spirit, and up on the screen should come an image of your future. Amen. It should live and breathe on the inside of you. It should be your most dominant thought. It should be the thing that wakes you up early in the morning, thing that keeps you up late at night. In fact, Mark 11 says this, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. Believe that you receive it and you shall. Believe that you receive it and you shall. Simon Peter wasn't actually expected to get interrupted by Jesus. But Jesus interrupted his day-to-day life, the pressures of work that he was under and brought a miracle. And I believe that's what God wants to do in your lives today. Yes? So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank You for this Word. I just pray, Lord God, that this Word will resonate deep in our hearts. Keep it fresh in our thoughts this week, Lord God, as we go about our day-to-day lives. Help us to be expectant. Help us to know, Lord God, that You are with us. Help us, Lord God, by faith to launch out into the deep, not in the shallows. We need to be out in the deep with You, Lord God, where we're receiving Your grace, Your mercy. Lord, we are receiving a fresh anointing of You, of empowerment. 
Embolden us, Lord God, as we go out into our workplaces this week. Give us fresh eyes to see. Enlighten our eyes, Lord God, to see. Let um, the light flood our souls, Lord God, and help us to see what we could be if we anchored ourselves to You, if we invited You into our boat this week. What, what miracles could You provide for us? In Jesus' mighty Name, Touch each and every person in this place, Lord God, right now. And I pray for a great and mighty breakthrough to occur in our lives, in our finances, in every area of our lives, in our families. In Jesus' mighty Name, Amen. Amen, Amen, Amen. Give a lot of hand, hey?